and get started, I think. Um, so, hello everyone. I'm very excited to be here and I hope you guys are too. Um, my name is Tori and as you can see, I'm a software engineer at Google Stadia. Um, and for those of you who don't know what that is, Stadia is Google's cloud gaming platform. It allows people to stream and play games that would normally require like an Xbox, PlayStation, or a gaming PC um, to play them with just uh, that you can do. So uh, we have to be running our tests constantly. We have to write these tests and make sure that they're always passing and not put in code that's going to break them. So that's a very important part. And honestly, I will say testing usually takes longer than the development part. It's unfortunate, <laughs> but my most recent um, thing I worked on this week, it took me a few hours to make to implement something and two days to test it, um, to write all the tests. So um, that's a big part of software engineering. And sometimes you learn it in school, but a lot of the time you don't because you don't have to maintain your code. Um, so that brings me to the next one, which is maintenance. This is a big part of software engineering because um, maintenance happens over time. It's not immediate. You, you do immediately design and you develop and then you test. But maintaining the code is something that you know you're going to have to do. And so this is where it's it's valuable to you to write good code. Do not incur technical debt. And um, this happens when someone else breaks the code and your tests get broken, or when someone wants to add a feature to your code and they come to you for help, support, reviews, um, anything like that. And Every time you write code, it's your responsibility to make sure that it continues to work. So if you're constantly writing new code, you're incurring a lot of responsibility there. And that can be hard. Um, you can hand off so to stream and play games that would normally require like an Xbox, PlayStation, or getting it started, I think. Um, so hello, everyone. I'm very excited to be here and hope you guys are too. Um, my name is Tori. And as you can see, I'm a software engineer at Google Stato. Um, and for those of you who don't know what that is, Stadia is Google's cloud gaming platform. It allows people to stream and play games that would normally require like an Xbox, PlayStation, or a gaming PC um, to play them with just a Chromecast or a controller or just a Chrome browser or even on tablets and mobile. So um, that's what I'm working on. And there will be a Q&A section at the end, but if you have relevant questions in the middle, feel free to use the chat room here. Um, I'll also be posing questions that um, you can answer, whether it's in your head, or um, writing it down for yourself or in the chat room itself. Um, feel free to use that um, and familiarize yourself with that because this talk is about you, you all and it's for you. So um, feel free to talk to me so I can talk to, about what you guys want to talk about. Um, so yeah, uh, first I'm gonna give you a little bit of my background and you guys can decide whether I'm qualified or not to talk to you uh, based off of that. Um, so yeah, I'll jump right into it. I grew up in England Village. Um, and Cis, <laughs> Incline Village is actually a small town in the Sierra, so I didn't really know much about computer science, and I'd never even heard of AP computer science. And in fact, I had written a line of code before I went to college. So if you guys are in high school or before, then you're already having me there. Um, it was, um, anyway, I went to Cal Poly and declared my major in computer science. And... That was fairly random. Uh, I still hadn't written a line of code when I declared my major. So, um, it turned out to be a good choice, but um, it was, again, pretty random. I knew I liked math and science, and computer science appeared more practical in pursuing those uh, majors. So my first class in computer science was actually an art class, and I didn't expect to like it, but I really did. Um, yeah, in the village in Nevada. <laughs> um, it really, so this art class really brought out this um, perfection side of me, where you actually create art that is perfect in computer science, and that was really cool. Um, and so the penguins falling from the sky over there is actually my very first game that I created, um, my first year of college, and basically you catch them on an iceberg before they get eaten by orcas. And I really got hooked on interacting with the user in this way. Um, and it's really challenging to make sure and force the users to interact in the way that you want, because users never interact in the way that you tell them to. They always try to find shortcuts or do things they're not supposed to. Um, so I got really excited about that. And at first I actually went into web development thinking it'd be similar and there were a lot more jobs in it. So my first two internships were in web development. One of them was at a, um, just in my college town, uh, Cal Poly Slow, San Luis Obispo. And the other one was at Apple. But by the second 
internship, I honestly hated web development. It wasn't the same thing as graphics. Um, it was visual and you're interacting with the user, um, but it was less map oriented and less, um, you're not trying to create this realistic world in um, that way. So what do you do when you have two in, like, internships in a job you don't want to do? <laughs> um, and I have one internship left and I'm worried that I'm going to be stuck in web development forever. So one interesting thing that I learned here was that I could tailor my resume not for the not just for the job that I was trying to get, but to what who I wanted to be. So even though I was able to modify it a little bit to make to show to explain in my resume everything else that I did. So I tried to reduce the amount of web development that was there and focus on the other parts that I did. I couldn't avoid uh, I couldn't just take off the internships that I had because that was all the experience I had. But you can kind of tailor it in a way that you're looking at other parts of the internship. Um, and I started throwing graphic into my resume and doing that sort of thing. And my third internship was with Google in Switzerland, and it was a backend internship. So I'd made progress. <laughs> I was no longer in web development. I was very excited um, to do something new. Um, and that was fun, but I still wanted to do graphics, and that wasn't in graphics. But the other issue is that I also wanted to work for Google. Um, and at this point, um, Google wasn't in the video game industry. Uh, nobody knew that they were. And for some reason, I still put graphics on my resume and made it look like I wanted to do video games and um, applied to Google again. And by doing this, it actually opened up a door that I didn't know existed. Um, Google. Google Stadia was still a secret project at the time, and so I had no idea that um, this was an option for me to do video games and graphics and Google at the same time. But my resume, who, that was tailored to who I wanted to be and the job that I wanted more than the job that I was applying for, um, got picked up by a hiring manager on Stadia um, way before the name existed or the platform was announced. and um that's how i ended up on it uh two years before or it was a year before it launched um i think yeah so it's been two years now um and yeah that's most of the story here so just as a note there it's still an in interesting thing what's well, still important to tailor your resume to the job that you're applying to and i know um, that's what you're told, but don't forget to also include what you want because you never know the doors that will open. Um, so put yourself on the resume, not just um, the job that you're immediately applying for. And like, and the other part about this is that there are so many fields in computer science that you should really um, Think about your other passions outside of computer science, and if you can connect multiple passions within computer science, that is the best way to go. Um, for example, if you're interested in music, there's countless um, apps and companies that work to stream music, make music, correct music, anything, and you're working, you could be working with artists and whatnot. Um, so just think, just think about that. Um, there's so many jobs out there. Anyway, the next couple things that I wanted to talk to you about was more on what it's actually like to be a software engineer in industry. Um, and I'll give you some real life examples and then um, maybe talk a little bit about what, how, we, how you guys can get there um, and advice that I have for you. And feel free to ask questions along the way. Um, so does anyone know what, what makes a software engineer? What is it? What do they do? And I'll give you a few minutes to think about it or write it in chat, um, or write it down for yourself. I see problem solving. That's true. And develop software and hardware, yep. Is there anything else?
and they code. <clears throat> That's the big answer that people usually give. Um, so the definition for software engineering that I like is it's someone who designs, develops, tests, maintains, and evaluates computer software. So developing and coding, that's the develops part of it. But that's honestly only a fifth of what computer science is or what a software engineer does. <laughs> um, and there's a lot, lot more to it and a lot more that we have to go through. Um, so, <clears throat> um, we're going to go through all these things and see why we need all of them. Most of the time in school and um, you really focus on the develops part, the coding part. Um, and that's where you're actually creating. And while this is important, it's not the biggest, it's not necessarily the biggest part of your job. It's um, just one part of it. So to give a, an example, um, software engineer this product comes to you. Um, these are the people who manage um, what Stadia is basically. And they say that developers want you to automate testing their game on Stadia one of, or want a way to automate testing their game on Stadia. So we work with developers a lot um, to help get their game onto Stadia. And this is um, a real challenge that we've had to solve. And basically, they want to make updates to their game and um, be able to know that it will, it will work on Stadia without manually testing every aspect of it every single time. And so they want to be able to write these tests. Um, and so if they come to you with this task, do you just start coding? Like how, where do you even start? Where, is it specific enough? Um, yeah, we're, um, <laughs> this is definitely something that really happens. That's all they give you. Um, and in school, you often get a strict set of requirements, like a test suite that has to pass, or sometimes you're given the freedom to build something that you're interested in. And now this prompt might look like freedom, but don't be fooled. In the real world, your users want something and they don't know exactly how it will work and they might not even know how they want it to work, but they will know if you do it wrong. So it's really challenging when you're posed with a question like this. And there's a few different um, ways you can start to figure this out. Um, can any of you guys come up with like, where, where do you start with this prompt? What do you do? Ask questions and meet with the team. Yeah, that's a really good one. That's definitely something that you need. And you have to figure out which questions. And trial and error, that's another one. Um, those those are definitely the ones that um, I would do first. You have to ask the right questions because um, if you just say be more specific, they don't know how to do that usually. And so you get a use case, like give me an example of exactly what you want to happen. Um, and you can ask more specific questions and whatnot, but honestly, sometimes they don't even know what they're looking for. Um, and reverse engineer the prompt, yeah. So this is where the design um, part of software engineering happens. You, <clears throat> yeah, you go to the user and you get your use cases and um, you get all the information you can, but sometimes you don't get much more than this. Sometimes you'll just get, you know what, I want a way to launch a game, I want a way to interact with the game, and I want a way to collect these results. And um, then you have to figure out how to get it done. So here, the best part at this point is you have to just start a design. Think about, um, you know, the happiest path. Think about, you can simplify the problem a little bit and just say, okay, maybe the user wants to do right on the command line, Stadia launch game. And so you um, 
design a way for this to happen. You, you write it down like, okay, this is the method that we're going to go through. Stadia launch game, um, st like Stadia, and send this information to the game so that the character moves forward or the game starts um, or they're driving their car, whatever it is. Um, and then um, Stadia print results. And you give an example of how what results you might want. Um, and so you basically just create it for yourself and then you go through designer views and you do this with product and the developers can um, see it sometimes if that's what they want. Um, and you talk to developers, is this like, is this what you meant? Is this what you want? And this, and then you go through um, peer reviews and technical reviews with your team so that they can point out roadblocks or other things that might be difficult. Um, and so all of this is done before you even start coding, because imagine if you did start coding and you thought you knew what they wanted and it turns out they didn't and you have to completely scrap it from the beginning. It's better to find out early. You want to figure out if you're doing it incorrectly early on and as soon as possible. And this is where the design um, really makes um, really makes it faster to iterate on products um, because you stay like, okay, this is what I'm thinking. Is this correct? Is it even feasible? And you get feedback and you iterate and you go through multiple rounds of iteration with design usually before you write your first line of code. And then um, that is when you develop. <laughs> um, and so I think you guys are pretty familiar with the development part. It just means doing the thing, making it work. And when you finish with a feature, you've probably tested it and it works manually, right? Um, and you say, hey, I'm done. Is that it? Does anyone else know what else you have to do um, after the development part? I see test it, which is correct. Yes. And why do we have to test these products? What's what's the point of it? You've already done it manually. So, and you've seen it work. Why test it? So it works and the user doesn't get a bad product. That's true, but I already said that you tested it. <laughs> um, you tested it manually, but why do we write tests? Why do we make sure that these tests are running um, constantly? Um, so that the player can play it easily. Um, yes, but again, this is like, we want to write tests so that um, cover edge cases and get rid of any bugs. Yeah, you definitely want to cover all of the edge cases um, with your tests and you definitely find bugs when you're um, testing. And so one of the things that can be difficult with manual testing is covering all of these edge cases. Um, and it's pretty time consuming too. And so one of the things and one of the reasons why you test is like beyond just the manual first testing is so that if things change in the future, for example, um, let's say a library that you're using gets deprecated, um, meaning that they're no longer supporting it, or they could even change their functionality. And this could break your code pretty easily. And so you have to write these tests so that they run so that every time people make changes, um, in other places outside of the product, you can be sure that it still works as it's expected. Um, because changes are being made to every, to most libraries all the time. So, and sometimes they're gonna create bugs and these bugs could get introduced to your code and you don't want that. 
So um, th those are good reasons. And another good reason to test is because let's say product or the developer comes back and says, well, we also want to be able to start up two games and have them interact with each other to automate testing multiplayer. Or we want to automate testing how this scene works on a faulty connect internet connection. Um, there's a lot of different um, things they could also ask for. In addition, this is, um, you know, one feature where other features get built on to it over and over again. So then, great. You go and you add this new feature to it and you manually test that feature. And what happens? then you can't just test that feature. You also have to test all previous functionality every single time. Um, and then another feature gets added on and you test that feature. And then you also have to test all previous features and um, make sure everything still works after you've changed your code. And so this is a big part of why testing is really important because it gets harder and harder the more features you add in and the bigger your code base gets. And um, you can probably guess the Google code base is pretty big um, and we can't afford to be manually testing every single combination of um, use cases that users can do. <laughs> so um, we have to be running our tests constantly. We have to write these tests and make sure that they're always passing and not put in code that's gonna break them. So that's a very important part. And honestly, I will say testing usually takes longer than the development part. It's unfortunate, <laughs> but my most recent um, thing I worked on this week, it took me a few hours to make an, to implement something and two days to test it, um, to write all the tests. So um, that's a big part of software engineering. And sometimes you learn it in school, but a lot of the time you don't because you don't have to maintain your code. Um, so that brings me to the next one, which is maintenance. This is a big part of software engineering because um, maintenance happens over time. It's not immediate. You, you do immediately design and then you develop and then you test. But maintaining the code is something that you know you're going to have to do. And so this is where it's, it's valuable to you to write good code, to not incur technical debt. And um, this happens when someone else breaks your code and your tests get broken, or when someone wants to add a feature to your code and they come to you for help, support, reviews, um, anything like that. And every time you write code, it's your responsibility to make sure that it continues to work. So if you're constantly writing new code, you're incurring a lot of responsibility there. And that can be hard. Um, you can hand off that responsibility and you definitely do and you share that responsibility with your team usually. But it's definitely something that takes up a lot of your time the longer you've been a software engineer at the same um, in the same place because you have suddenly touched all of these different um, code bases and now you're responsible to make sure that it keeps running. Your users are counting on you. So there we've done, we've designed um, how developers are going to automate testing their game on Stadium. We developed we it, we tested it, and we're ready to maintain it. Um, is that it? Does anyone know if there's anything, anything left here? One release, that's correct. It's actually not one that I was um, covering, but I had a note to. <laughs> um, but yeah, you have to release it. And um, this is often called rolling out. And it's basically the process of moving your code from development to production. You've developed it and you've, um, you've tested it. You're sure that it, you're confident that it works. And so now you actually have to give it away. Um, so 
For many services, including Stadia, this is something we do every week. We roll out new software features, bug fixes, and honestly, probably introduce new bugs. Um, and we do this every single week. And um, a big part of this is, um, is evaluation. And that's the next um, step. So basically, you, you wrote all this code and you're giving it to your users, but how do you know that they like it or, or if they're happy or if, they, if it's what they wanted? Um, how do you know it's even working correctly in production? And so this is where evaluate part comes in and it's a really important one um, that really you don't get the option or like the opportunity to do it in um, school very often because um, nobody's using the code that you write for your classes usually. But it's a big part of figuring out um, whether it's a, or it's a big part of software engineering. And so this is done by a few different ways. One way in this example would be, of course, to ask the developer, hey, are you happy? Like, is this what you wanted? Um, what do you think of it? But um, as you're doing more and more features you, or you add features on top of one, it becomes unrealistic to ask um, developers over and over again or the same, your same user, like, are you happy? Is this enough? This is what you, what you wanted. You don't want to ask them that every week and they don't want to give you an answer every week. They want their product and they want to be happy. And so this is where metrics come in. And so we deal with a lot of metrics and look at a lot of metrics every single day. And metrics can be in the form of a survey to the user. So, um, <clears throat> you know, after you play a game on Stadia, it asks you, um, how was your session? And you ask, answer from excellent to poor or something like that. And it could also be in the form of how many errors there are, how many times did the game crash. Um, and we read these metrics every single, um, or we see these metrics every single day. And you need to make sure that you know when there's like a drop in happiness or a spike in errors that you're alerted. And this is another part of um, maintaining the code. Sometimes you'll roll something out or sometimes seemingly out of nowhere, you'll start to see crashes spike and you have to figure out why this happened. Um, and this is a big, this is definitely something that um, we look at every day, um, <laughs> all the time, especially if you're on call. And it's a big part of the release process too, because if you're doing a big service like Stadia or all of Google, you can't just push, push a change out all at once. You need to roll it out slowly because if you push it out all at once, it's going, it could fall over or it could even, um, um, like you could push a bad image without knowing it. There are def plenty of bugs that get through um, testing and manual testing and you never find them until they reach production and your user does something weird and um, uncovers a bug. So um, <clears throat> one of the ways that we mitigate this is by rolling out to say 1% of users. And then you need a way to evaluate that 1% against, um, against the entire um, fleet. So we evaluate 1% against the 99% and usually you automate this and so like you have a machine looking at these metrics and deciding whether it's a good build and once that passes then you roll out to 10 percent and you evaluate it again and if everything goes well you finish rolling it out to your users if not you roll it back and you figure out what happened you fix it and you try again and so the this is something that happens every single week for us and um that's pretty it's a pretty common um, cadence for software engineering as well. And our on-caller does this to um, Stadia. <sighs> so we've gone through all of the software engineering um, steps and stages. And I hope this opened you up to a little or gave you a better idea of uh, 
what a software engineer actually does and how long it takes to get to just do a feature um, and what it all entails. It's not just development. Um, but it's all exciting and new. So I was going to talk to you guys about um, advice I had with interviewing with both Google and just personally. Um, and so these are my points, so they might be a little bit different than what you might find on average um, on the internet. So these are things that help me. So the first thing to think about is think about it from the interviewer perspective. Like, what do they want? Um, what is the point? Why are they interviewing you? And they want to see where you're at and they want to know your skill. So it's really good to recognize that if you can actually finish an entire question or an entire interview question, then it's not a very good question because that means they're, they found out that you are at least this good, but they didn't actually test where, they didn't actually find out where you are. They want to, you to finish somewhere in the middle because um, that's what makes a good question. Um, and that's how they figure out uh, where you are in your learning, your studies, or just um, in the world. <laughs> um, and so if you're finishing this question with time to spare, then it's not a good um, question. And so if you think about that, don't think that you have to finish everything. You don't, um, when you're overwhelmed and looking at it, looking at an interview question, don't think like, oh my God, I can't finish this. Um, you're not supposed to. <laughs> You can work on it in stages. You just need to make progress. They want to see your work. And the biggest thing is to talk out loud um, and design first. So they say this a lot, and it's very true. If you're not talking, there's no way for them to know whether you're thinking at all. <laughs> um, and so one, good, one advantage of talking out loud is that they could actually give you hints or steer you in the right direction if you're going way off. Um, and the other <clears throat> part is like if you design first and they see it and um, you can kind of get a feel of whether you're going in the right direction um, before you get too far in, before you're deep into coding. <laughs> um, and so, but this shouldn't, take too long. You should be writing code within the first um, five to ten minutes, five minutes of them giving you the question. Um, but that doesn't mean you have it all figured out <laughs> at all. <laughs> you, um, so, but yeah, just don't leave silences or too long of a silence in the interview. If you need silence to think, that's fine, but um, they need to hear what you are thinking as well. Uh, ask questions when you're unsure because um, sometimes you're thinking of a problem way bigger than um, it actually is, or sometimes they'll allow you to start smaller. Um, sometimes, again, they'll give you hints or <laughs> um, things like that. And another point is to test your code. So um, if you are towards the end of the interview, um, like time-wise, and you're not sure whether you should um, try to optimize it or fix something or just test that it works, I think you should go to test your code that, and make sure that it works um, route. Because if they see you work through it and you show that it works, um, Um, and it's, I know it's not simple and, um, I mean, it's a lot easier said than done, right? Um, but what I mean by that is don't just stare at your whiteboard without talking. It's okay to get stuck, but don't go silent. And, um, I have some advice if like you are at the staring at the whiteboard or wherever it is, 
um, on a phone screen. And there's a couple different options. One is to use the brute force algorithm. This is a route that I go a lot when I'm looked at when I'm looking at a really scary um, interview question. Use the brute force algorithm. It um, it often like you can tell your interviewer like you know what I'm gonna start with brute force and then we're gonna see where it goes from there. And um, then you can optimize it as time goes on but at least you have an answer there brute force is better than no answer at all and you can talk about at the end about how you would improve it you don't have to actually code it all um simplify the problem add some constraints that make it easier you want to get something on the board you want to have um some solutions so if that requires simplifying the problem then do it um and then finally explain why you're stuck so again, um, don't just stare. <laughs> um, say like, this is what I'm thinking. I'm not sure what to do about this. And they'll give you um, a hint because they don't want to stare at you staring at a whiteboard for 30 or 45 minutes. Um, that's not enjoyable for anyone. Um, and they do want to see you succeed unless you have an awful interviewer. Um, they don't <laughs> want you to fail. And in the end, practice um, pra like practice interviewing and doing a lot of them really makes a big difference. And the other part is good luck because, um, unfortunately, like you could get an interviewer that has had a really bad day and part of it does come down to luck. And I think this is good to know because you can do everything right and still not get the job. And that's unfortunate. And sometimes it comes down to head count and so don't it's not the end of the world um and you can try again and with google specifically um always talk about scale and challenges in scaling a product for example like um how much data space um or data like space you need to store all this data if it's a lot of data um do evaluate the speed of your program at the end, um, like this is ON, ON squared, and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> and it's fine if it's not fa the fastest way. It's totally fine as long as you recognize that. Um, and just tell them what the speed is. And try again. You can apply most places well, at least once a year. Um, and like I said, a lot of it comes down to luck. So. Um, so this apply, applies to like a lot of different companies. If you have a dream job, then don't give up on it because you didn't get in the first time around. Um, I didn't get into Google my first time around. And so, yeah, Cracking the Coding Interview is the book that I use a lot, which just has a ton of um, practice questions. And it's just good to um, get, all the um, get all the practice that you can. Anyway, um, I think that's all I have for you. And I'm gonna leave it open to the floor for questions. Um, feel free to ask questions in the group chat. <clears throat> uh, which resources did you use to prepare for interviews? Um, and I used a book called Cracking the Coding Interview, which was really um, big. And it just, it's basically like a book this thick and it just has interview question after interview question. And it's pretty fun to go through. Um, and you get pretty exhausted after a while. But there's also tons of websites um, I know that are out there. I haven't used very many of them. Um, but for Google's interviews specifically, they're just, they're just um, like questions that you'll get out of cracking the coding interview. None of them are the same, but there's, um, you get a lot of similar technical uh, questions. Um, and what else? Is software engineering at a company like Google a continual learning process? 
more so than college. Um, more so than college, it's hard to say, <laughs> um, given that I went from knowing zero um, coding, but yes, uh, it's, it's definitely continual. I'm learning new, um, like how to use new products within Google and outside of Google and building new things every day. And the other um, thing about Google is that it's so big, you're never going to actually understand all of it. I mean, I would never understand all of Stadia. And so um, you can always, they make it really easy for you to switch between teams if you are bored, which um, I've been here for two years now <clears throat> and I'm like every new project is, uh, very new and I'm learning new things. A lot of the time I'm learning a lot about Linux. Um, and um, yeah, yeah, you learn a lot. And if you're not for whatever reason, it's so easy to, they make it very easy to switch teams and you can find a new job within Google. I got, how many times did you apply to Google? Um, <clears throat> I think I applied my freshman year and I didn't get in. Um, I don't think I even got a response back. <laughs> um, and then I applied my sophomore year um, of college and I never, I wasn't able to finish it um, cause that's when I got an offer from Apple. And then my junior year, um, I pretty much, I, I applied to Google in Switzerland um, because I really wanted to do an internship abroad. And I, I think that actually helped. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I ended up getting my interviews there and um, getting my first internship with them. And then <clears throat> from there, I was able to convert as a full-time, which required more interviews, but it was a little bit easier having um, the internship under my belt. And <clears throat> what are some of the things you need to learn in order to qualify to be a software engineer at Stadia at Google? Um, that's a great question. I don't think um, there's any one thing. Um, you need to be able to pass the interviews. But honestly, my boss um, dropped out of college, never finished it. <laughs> and he's one of the smartest people I know at Google. So um, it's you don't actually um, need anything if, um, but it obviously helps to have, you know, a bachelor's degree in computer science and um, like to get the, that first interview that really helps. Referrals help, um, but in the end, Google wants to hire the smartest people. So um, you just need to show them that in the interview. And they code in a lot of different languages. So I'm not going to say that you need one language more than another or anything like that. Um, and today I code in C++ and Golang, but Google writes a lot in Java um, and many other languages. Um, there were about five. So there's, I think, going straight to full time, you have to go through five interviews kind of all at once. Um, or I think it's one, um, two phone screens and four interviews. Um, and they're all technical. And for me, I went through two phone screens my sophomore year when I didn't um, finish the process, two more phone screens my junior year, and then two more um, in-person interviews. Anyway, I think we're running out of time, but I'll read this last question. Do higher companies like Fang only hire people who go to um, top schools or give internships for top school students? Um, no, that's definitely not true. Um, it, <laughs> um, it probably helps, but I know tons of people at Google who um, either didn't graduate or um, went to schools that I've never heard of. Um, and 
so yeah, don't um, think that that <laughs> um, gets you out of there. And again, you can apply over and over again. So if you don't get in the first year or the year that you want, um, you can definitely try again. And with that, I think I'm gonna um, finish the presentation. So thank you everyone for listening and um, coming in and that's all. Bye. <laughs>